Hello, Grace. Hi, David. How are you? I'm, I'm pretty good. I want to talk to you about the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, mm. heading off to Taiwan. I, I, I have no idea why she is doing that. Here's what I figure. Foxconn is a publicly traded company that comes out of Taiwan. If she's going to Taiwan, I would assume Paul Pelosi is, is going to buy $5 million worth of stock in Foxconn, and we should all get in on it. That's the, that could be the only reason she's going to Taiwan for inside information for her criminal husband. <laughs> what, what, is, what is she doing conducting foreign policy? What is going on here? Uh, well, she's got a long history of being quite hawkish on China. She's been involved in the kind of Tibetan cause. She's of, she often makes statements that are kind of um, drawing attention to, you know, China's human rights record and so on. So this is sort of on brand for her. Um, I would say, however, that it is um, extremely bad timing. And I would say also very poor judgment on her part. Um, and she was actually due to make this trip in April, but she got COVID, uh, so she had to cancel. And back in April, there were actually rumors that China had warned the US government, warned the Biden administration, that her plane would not be allowed to land in Taiwan. It was quite a serious threat if if that indeed was was what was said, it's a rumor. But yeah, if that was on the table, then then we should be quite worried about this. Um, in the past week, since the story of her trip leaked, China has apparently issued some more sort of private warnings, um, and these warnings are apparently much stronger than they have been before. Um, for example, when the senators, I think, back in Early this year, uh, a delegation of senators visited Taiwan, including your favorite, Lindsay O. Graham. Um, but right now, China is, is on high alert for this visit. Um, and there's been a suggestion of a, of a possible military response. Now, I don't want to kind of hype this any more than it needs to be hyped. But I, I do want to talk about, firstly, why this is such bad timing, and secondly, the sort of historical precedence for this kind of a, a crisis, if we can call it that. Um, I should say also that Joe Biden himself has said he uh, he he's a bit hesitant about this trip. He's he came out and made a very strange statement. Where he said the military is not a good idea right now. So I'm he sorry, kind of pinned his objection. Little, he said what? You, you, you were breaking up when you were quoting Joe Biden. So you sound exactly like him, which means we, we couldn't make any <laughs> sense. <laughs> um, so he apparently, Joe Biden said, that the military said, this is not a good idea right now. So he's channeling the military in his response to this. Um, I think the reason he said that is because Joe Biden and Xi Jinping are due to have a phone call at some point in the next week or so, um, allegedly before the end of July. Uh, and so this would be very bad timing in that respect. Um, and basically this, this kind of a, uh, I think it is a, Fair to say it's a provocation. The problem is none of the parties here, like the US, Taiwan and China, none of them can win in this situation because if Nancy Pelosi backs down and doesn't go to Taiwan, of course, people are going to say that makes the US look weak. Um, if, if she goes, then obviously there's a real risk of escalation. Um, and kind of negative impact from that. And Taiwanese officials, by the way, have said that they feel trapped, right, in the middle of this. Um, there are two bad outcomes for them as well, one in which China is emboldened by 
what it perceives to be um, US weakness, and the other in which Taiwan is basically punished by Beijing for receive, receiving Pelosi. So it is, it is messy. Um, and however, there is a historical context that is quite interesting for this, and that is the third Taiwan Strait crisis, which happened in the mid 90s. So between July 95 and March 96, the US and China came quite close to war actually, um, closer than I think we imagine, closer than I can imagine, having not really been um, around, well, not been reading the news at that point at least. And this, this crisis, uh, there are sort of similar things and differences as well that we can draw from this that I think are very interesting. Um, just a little overview of the, of the third straight crisis. It was triggered by the Taiwanese president at that time. He visited the US, not in an official capacity as such, but he visited the US to attend a reunion at Cornell University where he had got his PhD. This is Li Tang Hui um, was his name. And he was granted a visa, I believe by the US Congress, uh, despite the fact that the US had said to China, they had kind of, kind of given China an assurance that they would not receive any Taiwanese politicians, high level Taiwanese politicians. But he did go, he attended uh, his reunion. And in response, the People's Liberation Army fired missiles and performed live ammunition exercises in the Taiwan Strait in July of 95. Now the US responded to that by sending aircraft carriers. Um, it was the largest display of American might since the Vietnam War. This was under Bill Clinton. But while that was the kind of proximate cause, his visit was the proximate cause, there was an underlying simmering cause as well. And that was the transformation that was happening in Taiwan at that time. It was a very exciting time in Taiwan because in 1996, Taiwan held its first direct election for the presidency. And Li Dunghui was on the ballot and he eventually won. He won that election. Um, prior to that, Taiwan had been in a process, in a sort of gradual process of democratization, but presidents had been chosen by the National Assembly before that point. And China was not too happy about this. Um, given that only a few years ago, you had the Tiananmen Square incident um, or massacre, China was pretty sensitive to the idea that Taiwan would suddenly be holding kind of up in democratic elections directly for the presidency. So in March, a few months after that initial incident, when this election was gonna happen, the PRC decided to send a message to Taiwan's electorate and they wanted to basically dissuade them from voting for Li Zhenghui, the guy who had come to Cornell for his reunion. So they fired some more miss missiles, this time very close to Taiwan, about 50 kilometers kilometers um, off the shore. And again, the US responded. It sent two aircraft carrier strike groups. There was more kind of back and forth. And ultimately, China, it, its efforts to intimidate Taiwanese people backfired because voter turnout was 76% in that election. And Historians have said that they think that the PRC's actions actually boosted Li Dunghui's um, support by about 5%, which earned him a, ma a majority. Uh, and so in a, in a sense though, this was an interesting crisis because the US and China kind of both claimed victory the US, of course, their narrative was, well, we showed the Chinese, you know, we, um, they, they were overreacting. And so we displayed our, our, our might and they backed down. But for the Chinese, after this happened, the US did not 
receive any more Taiwanese presidents, did not issue any more visas like that um, until recently. And so these tensions are now kind of coming to the fore again with Pelosi's potential visit. But things are very, very different now. Um, you know, in the mid 1990s, China really did not have the capacity to invade Taiwan. And in its sort of post Tiananmen Square vulnerability, internationally, it was, it was still quite vulnerable. There were a lot of sanctions applied to China after Tiananmen Square. It really did need the US. Today, I'm not sure that's quite as true. I think it's still somewhat true, but China certainly doesn't need the US in the way that it did before. And the US-China relationship is in a much worse state than it was back then. And furthermore, Xi Jinping does not want to look weak right now because in autumn, in the fall, uh, there's going to be the 20th Party Congress, which the Party Congress happens every five years. And it's where a lot of the kind of top leaders are um, elected, quote unquote, elected. And this is where he becomes leader for life, basically, right? This is where he gets a third term, which is basically unprecedented since the 1980s when Deng Xiaoping institutionalized sort of orderly succession and a two term limit. So in 2018, listeners probably will be aware that Xi Jinping removed term limits or removed the two term limit that was in the in the Constitution since the 1980s. Um, and so he sort of set the stage for him to have a third term that will begin at this party congress. So this is a real landmark for him. Um, and China this year, you know, it's having a tough time with COVID. It's still maintaining its commitment to zero COVID. Um, its economy is not doing great. And there's just, you know, there's a lot going on and there's a lot of reasons why I think Xi Jinping does not want to look like he's faltering um, on an issue like Taiwan, which ultimately Taiwan is the number one, I would say, the number one foreign policy priority for Xi Jinping. We shouldn't underestimate that. Um, and so, yeah, things are very different now and we could see a very different outcome potentially. <laughs> What does she, what does she, well, she and Pelosi, also she, let's start with the other she, what does she want in terms of Taiwan? Um, what do, we've talked I, about this, do you, and it's hard to predict, but you don't anticipate his taking the island, right? Who taking the island? She's China, in mainland China. Oh, um, I I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon. No, I think that. So this is a very interesting question. If Xi Jinping has two more terms, so if he does ten more years in office, he's currently almost seventy years old, so he would be eighty. People think that's when he would probably step down, and many people think that he wants to make sure Taiwan is unified with the mainland under his watch, right, during his tenure. That gives us potentially a 10-year window. Our connection with Grace. Sorry, David. That's okay. It's the heat. I don't know what's in going our, on. In our limited time, Pelosi, yeah. what are the politics behind this? Gingrich wants her to go. Uh, Republican Ben Sass wants her to go. The Republicans are kind of all in on her stirring up the hornet's nest. So what what does she stand to gain? Challenging Biden? Is this some is this something for the midterms? What what's why I guess it, I, I guess it is something for the midterms. I mean, I think there's like a personal and a political calculation that she's making. I think, as I mentioned earlier, she's always had a bit of a hunch about China. Uh, she's had a bit of a bee in her bonnet about it. Um, at the same time, and I San think... San Francisco has a huge uh, Chinese immigrant population. A lot of people uh, left Hong Kong in the mm -hmm. 80s and moved to San, 
San Francisco. So there's a lot of Hong Kong money there that she's probably beholden to, right? Quite possibly. And also Taiwanese Americans, there's a lot of them also in the Bay Area. Um, but I, I think that this is partly performative for the midterms. I mean, Biden has already laid out this binary opposition between democracies and autocracies that has kind of structured at least his rhetoric on foreign policy. And I think that she could claim she's just following suit. She's supporting Taiwan, which is a democracy um, and standing up to China. I mean, there's a huge amount of bipartisan support for taking a hawkish stance on China right now, which is something that it, it's, it's another thing that feels quite new to me um, in all of this and potentially quite dangerous. So I think there's there's a few different considerations for her. Right. Uh, again, what does she stand to gain? What, what does America stand to gain from this? I mean, what does anyone stand to gain from a bit of good old fashioned virtue signaling? I mean, she gets to feel good about herself. She gets to be the girl boss. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think a lot of this is, is ideological at this point for, the Dem for both the Democrats and the Republicans. And is Biden searching for some sort of brinkmanship for October, is he looking for another crisis like Ukraine so that Americans get terrified and support the party in power? That, that seems to be the old playbook where you stir up a foreign policy issue so everybody rallies behind the party in charge. Uh, I'm reluctant to see any grand strategy behind any of this. I think more than anything, What's emerging right now is a sense that this government is very uncoordinated. It does not have um, it does not have a clear and consistent China policy. I mean, we've already had Biden make these little slips about defending Taiwan, this rollback of strategic ambiguity, and then of course his staff has come out and say, "Oops, sorry, no, he didn't mean it." I mean, I think there's just a lot of different issues there, one of them being Biden's own ability to kind of make policy, which seems to be impaired, um, but also a lack of coordination. And I think it's interesting that he is channeling the military when he says this is not a good idea right now, because I do think that the Indo-Pacific command people who are telling him this, who are probably the ones telling him this, they are probably much more in touch with the reality of the situation and what this would mean. You know, should Pelosi go to Taiwan? Should China not let her plane land and things escalate from there? They're the ones who will have to deal with that. And I think nobody who has a good sense of the conditions on the ground wants that war. Right. I will see you in August. You're coming to New York. Oh, yes, I, I will. I may well be in the neighborhood. Maybe uh, Jason will be in New York around the same time. So that will be great. Great. Grace, yes, I'll buy you coffee, David. Uh, okay. I'll let you buy but, coffee. If, you, not if like, you insist. But not as some sort of grandissimo latte with extra <laughs> foam that you're used to drinking. I'll get you a black filter coffee. Ooh. And uh, we can sit on a park bench. Good. Maybe. A pour over, one of those expensive pour overs. Oh, <laughs> Not right. made of money, Feldman. Grace Jackson is co host of The Literary Hangover, and she joined us today from Great Britain. Thank you, Grace. Always, Thank you. always fantastic. Thank you.